his faithful valet Cato, Rick Reeve, daring young publisher, matches wits with the underworld, risking his life that criminals and racketeers within the law may feel its weight by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Rick Reed in the thrilling adventure, Death in the Dark. The Green Hornet strikes again. Rick Reed, young millionaire playboy and publisher of the Daily Sentinel newspaper, was busy composing an editorial when he was interrupted by the buzz of the dictaphone. Yes, Miss Case? Mr. Haverhill is calling on line one, Mr. Reed. All right, put him on. Yes, sir. Hello? Hello? That's you, Britt? Yes. Britt, I've got to see you as soon as possible. It's important and confidential. For certain reasons, I'd rather see you at my home. Would you be willing to drop over early tonight? I'd appreciate it very much. I'll uh, come over about 8 o'clock, then, all right? Yes, that'll be fine. I uh, need some advice, and I know of no one who can give it to me better than you can, Britt. I'll be looking for you around 8 tonight. I'll be there, John. Bye. Goodbye, Britt. What is it, Chief? Gunnigan, I'm holding up this editorial on John Haverhill, so don't wait for it. I may have you run it in the morning edition instead. Okay, Chief. Just as you say. Is that all? That's all for now. Mr. Reed, do you have that editorial ready? It's getting close to the deadline for the next edition. I just spoke to Gunnigan in this case. I told him not to wait for it. You mean you've changed your mind about Haverhill? That you've decided not to back him for the council? No. So far, I'm still for John Haverhill. He has a clean record, and he's shown himself to be sincere in striving for the betterment of the city. Too bad the voters haven't shown enough interest in Dunlow's past. They wouldn't have put him in office if he had. Dunlow's a sleek politician. A good many voters have yet to learn if they want good government, they'll have to check more closely on the man for whom they vote. I know. Has something come up about Mr. Haverhill? Well, as you know, he just phoned. Seemed upset about something. Wants to see me. I thought I'd wait to find out what's up before I go out on the editorial, that's all. I see. Oh, by the way, phone Cato at my apartment. Tell him I'll dine downtown. I'm seeing Haverhill at his home at uh, 8 o'clock tonight. All right, sir. I'll call Cato right away. Good. Rather curious to know just what could upset a man like John Haverhill. So I don't want to be late for that appointment. <laughs> Promptly at 8 o'clock that evening, Rick Reed rang the doorbell of John Haverhill's comfortable home in the suburbs. Why, Britt Reed, how nice. Good evening, Loretta. Do come right in. I have an appointment with John. He asked me to come over tonight around 8. Really? He didn't tell me, but I'm glad you came. John came home this afternoon and he seemed so worried. I've never seen him quite like that before. Where is he now in the study? Yes. He came home about 4 o'clock, told me he didn't want any dinner. Then he went to the study, saying he didn't want to be disturbed. I heard him lock the door. He's been there ever since. Well, that is strange. Perhaps you'd better tell him I'm here. Yes, come along, Grid. I'm afraid the strain of the coming election is getting to be too much for John. He set his heart on being elected to the city council. I know. Here's the door of the study. John? John? Britt Reed is here to see you. John? Why don't you answer me? Are you sure he didn't go out, Lorna? Oh, I'm positive. And he never locks the study door when he's not in there. And very seldom when he is. John! John, open the door. Well, that's strange. Oh, Britt, I, I just noticed something. Usually when the study lights are lit, light shines under the door there. The lights must be out. Here, let me try. Are you in there, Haverhill? Please, Britt. Do something. Can you force the door? Oh, yes, of course, but... Then please do. All right. Here goes. <laughs> the lights are out. I snap them on. Oh, Brit. Look. John. John. Wait. Well, he's lying with his head on the desk. I can't tell whether... What? Uh, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, Brit. You don't mean it that John is... Yes, Loretta. I'm afraid I do. <laughs> we'll have to call the police. <laughs> The looks of it, John has taken his own life. He's dead. <laughs> Britt Reed notified the police of John Haverhill's death. Later in Haverhill's study, Reed stood talking to Sergeant Burke from headquarters and to Mike Axford, a reporter on his own newspaper. Well, Mr. Reed, looks like a cut and dried case of suicide, all right. The gun laying there on the floor with Haverhill's prints on it and the powder burns on his coat and all. Poor guy. Shot himself right through the heart. Yeah, it sure a blow to Mrs. Haverhill. And for that matter, it's a shock to me, too. Yes, Axford. Suicide is something I never would expect of a man like John Haverhill. That's what I say, Reed. 
And what's more, what reason would he have to do such a thing, I'd like to know? That's the only puzzle to me, Mike. I can't for the life of me figure out why he did it. Well, as I told you, Sergeant Burke, he seemed upset when he phoned me at 4 o'clock today. But he didn't give me even a hint as to what he was on his mind. Honey, his wife didn't hear the shot. I asked her about that. She said she was in another part of the house and maybe wouldn't notice it because she had the radio on most of the time. I see. Mrs. Haverhill told me his finances were okay. Poor guy. With a name he made for himself, raising funds for the city, as chairman of the Citizens' Welfare Committee, and with the Daily Sentinel backing him, he had a swell chance of winning the election. Oh, uh, that he did, Sarge. Yes. He was to have been the guest of honor at a banquet by the mayor's committee tomorrow night, which time Haverhill was going to turn over the funds that were donated to his committee. Well, now, thanks for We'd better get back to the Sentinel. Okay, Reed. See you later, Sarge. Yes, sure. So long, Mike. Good night, Mr. Reed. Good night, Sergeant Burke. <laughs> Late the following forenoon, Mike acts in his office in a state of surprised excitement. Reed, I just got some news down at Cops headquarters. It was about the Haverhill case. I found out why he committed suicide. Well, tell me about it. Sure, sure. That's why I came up to see him. See, Reed, it was this way. For reasons of my own, I stepped out of the press room for a minute. Then as I was coming back along the corridor, a guy came in that looked sort of familiar. As I hesitated a second and looked at him, he stopped and spoke to me. I beg your pardon, but I've come to headquarters to see Inspector Evans. Can you tell me which office the inspector's in? Sure. Glad you. Say, aren't you Mr. Kingman? My name is Kingman, yes. If you don't mind having a hurry. Oh, yeah. You want to see Inspector Evans. Second door down the corridor to the right. Thank you very much. Check the collections and donations each day during our drive. Then turn the money over to me, the bank. Well, the drive ended the day before yesterday. The money for that day amounted to more than twenty thousand dollars, which was put into the safe at welfare headquarters. I expected Haverhill to turn it over to me yesterday morning, but he didn't. Since most of it was in cash, as soon as I heard the bad news about him, I I opened the safe this morning in the presence of my secretary and found the money gone. And you think he appropriated that money for some pressing need? Then killed himself. Exactly. It seems to be a logical explanation. But uh, he wasn't the only one having access to the safe, was he? Yes, Inspector, he was. I had locksmiths come down and open it this morning. Well, why didn't you contact Mrs. Haverhill, see if she could find a notation of a combination among his effects? Well, I preferred not to be the first to start suspicion in her mind against her dead husband. Yes, so far as I can see, that would have been a normal request to make. Since you did have to have access to that safe, well, perhaps so, but I didn't see it that way. Well, no matter. I'm sure you act as you thought best, Mr. Kingman. Thank you for coming to me with the news. Oh, not at all. <laughs> I thought you should know the circumstances. As soon as I can check the exact amount that's missing, I'll let you know. And with that, he ups and left the inspector's office, barely giving me time to duck into a phone booth in the corridor. After he went out, I called Dunnigan and gave him the story. The other papers have it now. I can't believe John Haverhill would take that much. Funny thing, too. Mrs. Haverhill seems to think his finances are in good order. She said... Maybe she only thought so, Reed. Some guys are cagey with their wives about their finances, so I hear tell. Yes. And I can't bring myself to believe I was wrong about Haverhill. Yes, Mr. Reed. This case, get me everything that we have on Haverhill and also on Kingman. Have it all on my desk by this afternoon. All right, Mr. Reed. I'll get the material for you. Thanks, Miss Case. Ah. Oh, well, I screwed Yeah? What Kingman says turns out to be the truth. It will prove that this is one time I made a grave error in judgment in backing Haverhill for city council. Time will tell. That evening, after spending some time at the office going through the material on Haverhill and Kingman, Britt Reed put certain items in his briefcase. Then, leaving the office, he went to his apartment where Cato, his faithful Filipino ballot, was waiting. They discussed the Haverhill case. Do you believe what Mr. Kingman said to be true, Mr. Brick? No, okay, Kato, I'm afraid I don't. Even though Kingman has built up quite a reputation for himself in civic affairs. Well, people put great faith in Haverhill. It had a bad effect on election now that it said he commits suicide over theft of money from welfare funds. I know that. Kato, I've come to a definite conclusion about the Haverhill case. A conclusion that may startle even you. Well, what startling conclusion you arrived at, Mr. Brick? Just this. It was not a case of suicide at all. John Haverhill 
was murdered. Reed's startling announcement that John Haverhill had been murdered, Cato stood for a moment in surprise. Then he spoke. What made you think it murder instead of suicide, Mr. Britt? This was a photograph taken when John Haverhill opened the drive for welfare funds. Look here. Oh, he sit at desk with others standing behind him while he writes, it looked like. Yes, he was signing the first donation, his own to the fund. He gave a check for $100 at the time. Well, how'd that tell you anything? Haverhill was found slumped across his study desk last night. A bullet shot straight through his heart. And with the gun on the rug just below his dangling right hand where it had presumably slid from his fingers. The prince, of course, proved that it had fallen from his right hand. But I... Oh, now I see where you come to conclusion. Yes. In this photograph, Haverhill is signing the check with his left hand. He was left-handed. And under great stress, that would have been the hand he would have used. Well, why did not tell police you think Haverhill murdered? I intend to, Kato. They may not see it my way. Remember, too, that the door was locked along with the windows from the inside. Well, it'd be hard to prove it not suicide, Mr. Britt, even if it really murder as you think. It's necessary for someone who have motive to get the victim, also to leave room. I know. I'll tell Inspector Evans what I think about it and see what they can do. I'll phone him right now. After telling Inspector Evans of his conclusions, Britt waited to see what the police investigation would turn up. It was the following afternoon when he entered the city room to find the city editor, Gunnigan, talking to Mike Axford. Well, Chief, seems your theory about John Haverhill is knocked into a cocked hat. Oh, I saw. Well, you see, Reed, it's this way. The cops are certain it was suicide. But after hearing your theory, the inspector told me to go out with Bert just to satisfy myself, since they work for you, you know, that nobody could get in or out of that study. Well? We went out and took a good look around. Reed, the cops are right. That room was locked up tight. I checked the windows myself, and they were both locked up tight. I see. Did you try to open them? Of course not. I could see they were locked by looking at them. Now, the inspector says just because the guy might have been left-handed, that's no reason why he couldn't have used his right hand to kill himself. My theory is that he wouldn't. A person does the natural thing under great stress, actually. And it's a natural physical action for a hammerhill to use his left hand. What else? What's more, they went over the whole room for fingerprints. But no luck. And the police still stick to the idea that Haverhill was a suicide, eh? Well, sure. And for my dough, there's nothing else they can think. <laughs> I guess they thought you were trying to build up a story for the Sentinel, Chief. I suppose so. Well, I'm going back to my office, and then I'll hit... So long, Reed. <laughs> See you in the morning, Chief. Early that evening, at Britt's apartment... You think Kingman steal money from safe, then kill Haverhill, Mr. Britt? Could be, Kato. But there'd have to be more proof. And that's true. But Kingman gives long interview to Clarion Reporter. He talked much about being friend of Haverhill. Really? Yes, sir. Kingman says Haverhill spent entire evening before death at Kingman's home, listening to political speeches on radio. Haverhill have only small radio, and it not work, Kingman say. I see. Well, I... wait a minute. What do you think of him, Mr. Britt? Something was told me yesterday, Cato. I think it's time the Green Hornet took a hand in solving that. Green Hornet, go out tonight, sir? Yes. And the sooner the better. Let's go down to the Black Beauty. Right now. Where do we go first, Mr. Britt? Peter, I want to do a little investigating in Haverhill's study. The result of that will determine our next move. What you hunt for there? I want to see if there's any possible way for a person to get in and out of that room, leaving the door and windows locked from the inside. Step on it, Cato. <laughs> You tried to force window of Haverhill's study, Mr. Britt? No, kiddo. I want to look at those windows as they are. I'll force one of the living room windows to get inside the house. The door to the study is open now because I smashed the lock when I found it. Come on. Moving like two sinister shadows across the lawn, Britt and Cato made their way to the living room windows of the darkened house. Using a fine steel instrument on the catch of the wrench door into the living room, it was only a matter of seconds when they were inside the study. Brett immediately moved over to inspect the two windows in the study. You notice anything? Nothing yet, Kato. I... Yes. Look here. I don't see anything wrong. Hold that flashlight closer. Yes, sir. Our eyes are just about on the level with the window catches, Kato. Oh, yes, that's right. Notice anything now? Well, they're both common type of window catch. 
little raised edge that moved into groove of part in back when turned around. Try to raise that window with the catch still unlocked. <laughs> Move it. Not budge, of course, with catch on. I'll try this one. Yes, sir. <laughs> window opens, but catch still hooked. Yes. When one looks at it, it shows the catch is hooked. But it's a simple trick, kiddo. The catch was hooked first. Then the two little screws were removed from the back part. As long as the window was down, the catch seems to be secure and locked. But by raising the window, the whole catch, both parts go up with it. Then when lowered, see from outside, catch go it back in place and not be noticed. Exactly. The police were certain it was suicide, so they didn't scrutinize that catch too closely. Otherwise, they would have discovered the missing screws in back behind the catch. The murderer raised window, go out, pull down window. Then rooms seem all locked up with key on inside of door. That's very clever. That's how it was done, all right. Close the window. Yeah, but still, there's nothing to tell who is murderer. I hope before the night's over to make the murderer come into the open. Come on. I want to get to a phone booth. After leaving Cato in the Black Beauty, Britt had removed the mask of the Green Hornet and went to a phone booth where he made two phone calls. A short time later, at police headquarters... Police headquarters? What's that you say? A call from the Green Hornet? Hey, what's that call, sir? It's quiet, Mike. You think he's going to be where? You don't say. Great day. We'll get right over there and try to surprise him. Goodbye. Holy mackerel. The Hornet claims he knows how somebody got out of Harville's study. Says the guy was murdered. That he's going to get the missing dough from Harville's study. Holy crow. You mean the Hornet just talked to you? No, it wasn't the Hornet. It was Mr. Kingman who called. The Hornet phoned him. Come on, we'll tell the inspector, then get some of the men over to take this Falpine by surprise. Looks like it was murder after all. Let's get going. A short time later, Inspector Evans, Sergeant Burke, and Axford, with two policemen, moved stealthily across the porch of Haverhill's house. And not wishing to frighten away the person they had hoped to find in the study, they decided to effect an entrance with a master key rather than to awaken Mrs. Haverhill. Quiet now, all of you. We'll go to the door of the study and look in. Let's hope we catch that murder and hunt red-handed. Do you really think it was murder now, Inspector? I found that there was some way to leave that lock room. I'd be inclined to believe Mr. Reed's theory. Come on. Quiet now. Here's the study door, and it's open. <laughs> Glory be. Somebody took something from the desk. Let's go. Quiet. There's a small flash. Look, now he's going toward the window. He might go out. Let's get going. What's he doing? I don't know. But this is it. Come on. Snap on the lights. Don't move your cover. Holy crow, Inspector. Look. I, he, he's... He, I mean... Well, well, that's Mrs. Haverhill in slacks. I, I heard a noise, so I came down. You you frightened me. What were you doing there? I, nothing. Nothing at all. Hey, I... she was trying to tighten a couple of screws in back of the window catch. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> that's it. What? The way the murderer Haverhill left the room and make it appear that it was locked up. Very clever, Mrs. Haverhill. Great day, Inspector. You mean... Look, there on the desk, a bundle of dough. Let that alone. Stolen money or I miss my guess. Then then she's the killer? She murdered her own husband? Don't be ridiculous. Mrs. Haverhill, only two people could have known about that set lock. One who knew was the Green Hornet. The other is the person who killed your husband. That person is you. No, you came no. here to fix that lock because somehow you learned the Hornet might chip off the police. You didn't know someone else had already done so. Arrest her, Sergeant. We'll get the truth out of her. I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for some sneaking person who tried to be smart. Come along, ma'am. We're taking you to headquarters. You can talk all you want to there, and believe me, you will too before we're through with you. Come along now. <laughs> Late that night, Cato was talking to Britt Reed in his apartment. Well, Axford say over phone that Haverhill woman admit she murdered John Haverhill. Yes. Loretta Haverhill always was extravagant. She had access to the welfare office, and it coaxed the combination of the safe from John. She took money from time to time. The last collection was a temptation. She took it all. Her husband must have found out. I guess so. She said he was going to tell me about what she'd done, and was going to make her give back what she'd stolen. She didn't want to know it even to me, so she planned to kill him and make it look like suicide, knowing he'd get the blame. Well, what makes you suspect, Mrs. Haverhill? Now I have idea Kingman may be one who do it. I thought that at first, until I heard that Haverhill said his radio was out of order. Mrs. Haverhill told Burke she didn't hear the shot because she had the radio blaring most of the afternoon. I realized she was lying to hide something and figured she might be the guilty party. Her reaction to my phone call proved it. 
Kingman's reaction was to call the police. The woman even used you for alibi. Yes. When I found death in the dark there in that study, I didn't for a moment even imagine the killer was standing there beside me. Believe me, this is one case that really wore me down. Oh, yes, sir. And the Green Hornet win another victory. But this time, Britt Reed lose good friend. But the voter...